Yeah, if you're, yeah, yeah, they're smaller than they used to be. <laughs> so, okay, so tell me, I, uh, there's some, I want to talk about some specific things in just a minute, but there are some things that I do want to ask you about. I'm trying to get hello to everybody, and I believe these are your people. Your people is coming in. If not, everybody, hello. everybody, oh my goodness. I'm, trying to get... I'm a little bit subdued only because I can't be as flamboyant as usual because I literally can't like put my neck back, but I'll still talk with my hands and, you know, verbally dazzle. You, yeah. <laughs> oh, listen, you got the dazzle. See, uh, you got the dazzle, but I gotta, I gotta ask you, you gotta enlighten me on oh, no. you know, bodybuilding work that you've done and the competitions that you've been in that I didn't touch on the last time we were together last Sunday. Tell me a little bit about that, but you no, know, if people want to know more, they can go to your page, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, long story short, I'm a competitive person and I reached a certain age where I couldn't dance anymore. And then I went into competitive ballroom. I hurt myself and I couldn't do that anymore. Um, and then I was just missing being competitive and, in i don't know around 2013 somebody said hey you know what like you're at the gym a lot why don't you try like bodybuilding contests and i was like uh because i don't want to take steroids or do like i don't want to be jacked like that and um they're like no 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 haven't you heard of this like pageant type like bikini bodybuilding i was like yeah okay i could get down with that so then i checked it out and i was like okay it's just a challenge and so i found a coach and just entered a contest in through with three months worth of training and um i came in second and i was yeah then i was like oh okay i, I can clean house all right um and so yeah that began like it's a stupid pillow sorry i i couldn't even change i'm coming to you live in a bikini um i i uh yeah i just and, and i didn't develop sort of this love affair because i love the strength aspect of it and so um, I liked meeting other competitors. Like it felt like dance again, where you had a team and you could, you know, we traveled from Canada while well, I was already in the U S but we put a Canadian team together we went down to Savannah, Georgia and competed there. And it was just, it brought that family back and I really enjoyed it. Um, but along with it, you know, comes, especially when you're just working on your body and the way you look all day, every day, there, there's some negatives that come with it too, psychologically. And so, um i just stepped back for a bit my last contest was i ended up having to do it online this year because covid hit and then the contest kept getting delayed so i did one of the first ever online bodybuilding contests um and i all i could do was train with the weights i had at home to finish my training and i was already four months deep in and i came in fourth which was fine um That's yeah bad. I didn't, I, I mean, I couldn't finish. I had eight weeks left really, but I just, I was like, there's no way I can't, I don't, I don't have a treadmill. I, the, you, you have to drop so much weight. So yeah. Um, will I compete again? I think so. Um, the gyms here are just kind of crappy, but I did find an NPC affiliate here and there are contests here in Nicaragua. So I'm sure I'll, uh, yeah. When I build my own gym. Yeah. <laughs> You'll clean up in those competitions, huh? You'll just just you'll just beat down the competition in Nicaragua. I think I I mean I'm a different I have a different look and I'm tall for the girls and stuff. So um yeah, I have some time. Okay. But it'd be I'll fun. I'll follow her. I'm five foot seven. Really? Oh, you still that's a little, that's a, a, little over a little over average, yeah. But here, you know, the average is like what? five foot. Five. Yeah. <laughs> so then you put on like three or four inch heels, and you I mean then I'm you're, over six you're feet. Not, so yeah. you're you're looking down from the stratosphere on everybody else. At the, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you mentioned the gym. I saw a picture of the gym that you were in here in Nicaragua. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That was an interesting picture. I mean, uh, the, uh, video, I should say it was a video. Yeah. I, I joke. I'm like, if your gym can't give you dengue and tetanus, <laughs> I swear, I swear. then what are you even doing? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're not, ris you're not risking your life. And if you're not risking yeah. your life, work out. It's totally not. Yeah. That's all there is. Um, the equipment, they, they have a couple pieces I know from the U.S. The rest of it, what I managed to, to glean from working out there now for half a year is um, they saw it somewhere else and they fabricated their own equipment 
So it's very much like built for not everybody, the positioning for feet. Like it's quite dangerous actually if um, you're not careful because it's everything's lopsided or crooked and I don't know. So if you know, if you're going. <laughs> it looked like yeah. it did. You get some love on the screen. Here. Oh, I know. Ciao. Uh, by, the, by the way, um, can you do something for me? Tell me a little bit for for anyone that get a chance to hear this, and they dealt with, uh, they dealt with the challenge of cancer. What was your what was your journey like in dealing with Chef? Uh, it was really weird for me. Um, now when I think about it, so I'm like about twenty years almost to the day of the when it first started. Uh, long story short, um. I was in my early 20s and I had been to the doctor a bunch of different times. I had cervical cancer. And so that's like lady part cancer. And so in order for, you know, you'd even kind of find out what's going on with that, you either have to have like acute pain or you have to be in for a regular checkup. I'd gone for a bunch of regular checkups and um, basically they're just looking for abnormalities. And every other year it was kind of changing. So nothing happened for a while. Then one day I got a phone call and, and the nurse who was a total cow at my doctor's office was like you've got to come in and I said I've taken so many days off to come to the doctor I can't afford to take another day off and I'm not coming in unless you tell me what it is well we can't tell you these kinds of things over the phone I'm like okay well guess I'm not coming in <laughs> I was I was you know returning the favor of bitchiness and um, then she gave me this like really super clinical you know jargon that at the time I was like what and you know it was like 20 years ago so i'm sitting at the computer at work and i have internet but it's not like it it is now you know like and uh that uh, but i kind of you know every sphincter on my body like tightened up when i hit the google or whatever we were using at that time or aol or whatever right. and i was like oh okay i better go so i went and um they basically told me that over the years they had been monitoring it and didn't want to worry me but now the um cell counts and the abnormal cells were really screwed up and i needed to go deal with it so there's a bunch of investigative stuff that they do in that and then i was living on my own um in my early 20s and um then after all the tests they confirmed what it was and then they came out with the treatment which for that type of cancer if you're in that um in the level let's call it level of cancer stage of hi michelle um if you're in the stage of cancer that I had, um, you you have a good opportunity to be able to just not use chemotherapy, not have to do surgery and just use radiation um, in order uh, as a means of treatment. And so I did that. Um, it was, the whole process was tragic. The women you meet throughout the process is very, are, it, they're, they're traumatized. Um, the doctors were phenomenal. I was treated at um, BC Women's Hospital in Vancouver, Canada, um, old, uh, obstetrician gynecologist they're just he was a great old dude um and you know you can watch a lot of the procedure happen on cameras and stuff and like it was just it was overwhelming I didn't understand it my family wasn't super supportive like nobody really was um and I went through all the treatments for five weeks three times a week three times no five times a week for six weeks oh, I don't know I've blogged about it before um and finished and then was monitored and then it was every month every three months every six months once a year until everything eventually till i got my 10-year letter uh which i still have somewhere saying that your 10 years cancer free and um it's something to yeah Go you can and you can and you can um catch it like i mean you can catch it pretty quickly and my doctor was pretty good about it um what i didn't like is when i went in there uh, like when she was kind of guessing um at exactly what stage i was at she's like you know on the road of cancer and i remember very vividly from here to here you're like we think here wow and i was like on the road to oh, it like yeah, the right. road to it like okay i don't really like and how do i end up getting this because 20 years ago people weren't getting cancers like that no, you were getting cancer yeah, yeah. Like now where everybody gets cancer from, you know, God knows what. And back yeah. then it was, you know, your your uncles would die of heart attacks and somebody would get random breast cancer or something. But um, yeah, and so that, that kind of pissed me off. And then, um, you know, 
the care was fine. The care was good. It's not, uh, I was in Canada, luckily. So, I mean, it costs nothing um, other than it comes out of your taxes. So it wasn't something that I had to go into debt to resolve. Tim Cho. I went to high school with Tim Cho. Tim Cho, I think, is still in Vancouver, BC, but I'm not quite sure. He was a funny guy. Um, yeah, so... I don't know. It was it was an experience, and then people don't really want to talk to you about it. So um, your family didn't talk to you much about it back then. It was really okay after my first treatment. I did my first treatment, and people came. One, my girlfriend who I worked with, who's from London, and she's back in London, England now. She came and um, was there at my first treatment. Um, actually it wasn't even my first treatment. It was the leap procedure you have before then where they basically take a biopsy to confirm what it is. Um, so they were there for that. My mother came and my mother's mother came and my mother and her mother, who's uh, passed away a few years ago now, two years, uh, that's a whole other show. Um, they, I don't know why they were even hanging out together. They, don't. <laughs> they don't get along, but we all were there, the three of them, and they kind of just a little bit touched on it, didn't understand like what the procedure would be going forward. And so I spent the entire treatment period alone. Um, so I'd go to the treatments alone. I'd come home alone. Um, and, you know, you're like they're irradiating your body. So you're burned and bruised and you're kind of like falling apart from the inside. And there was no conversation about it. Um and even now, it's kind of weird, but my my I, my mom doesn't really even know what happened. And she said one thing that also just traumatized me, which makes me hate a particular word. Um, but when I said I had to go, you know, back in for all this treatment, she was like, "Oh, that's a bummer." And I was like, "Oh, you can take the bummer and shove it up your bummer." So <laughs> it was. Uh, I can't hear the word bummer ever again. <laughs> I'm just like a, bu a bummer. No, but that just um, impacts me negatively. But yeah, some they didn't really like ask questions, and I thought that was kind of really cold. Like, now what and when and can I be there and how are you feeling and can I bring you um, food? Nothing. I was living in a basement suite of this perverted dude from New Zealand's house. Um, like, I didn't have a ton of cash on the weekends. I would help him paint the exterior of his house to like make extra money and while I'm going through these treatments and like it was a very awkward like unsupported time so I kind of kept that entire story to myself because it felt like whoa hey do you want to hear my sad story about how my mom and I are kind of like <laughs> oil and water and and how that impacted a really crazy time in my life but I, I never felt scared I guess I saw people there who felt scared, who were worried that like, you know, when you're going in the clinic and everybody's getting lining up for treatments. And I remember saying, it's going to be fine. They've caught it so early. Like, you know, it'll be good. You'll be fine. The doctors are good. The doctor was amazing. Yeah. Um, the doctors, the nurses, the stuff. Yeah. So I never felt, I guess, like as abandoned as they could have. Now I probably am a bit more chapped about it. But <laughs> But but then you were trying to keep your spirits up. You were trying yeah. to be positive because you had to be positive for you. Yeah, and that's and that was a whole turning point for me. And when I did start speaking about it again was when I when I I was vegetarian at that time, and I decided the only thing I could do for myself was to like purify my life and you know a bunch of different ways. And one of them was to go completely vegan. I just I just became more aware, and um, I thought that was an empowering thing to be able to do for myself. So um, I, a, a lot of the other hocus pocus I didn't believe in, but I knew that ultimately what you're putting in your body is, is either, you know, medicine or poison. And so um, with food, I decided, you know, to change that. So that, yep, that was the catalyst to the fish hipping point. <laughs>